This is a question from our audience. Which bothers you more, non-Christian scientists who attack you or sneer at you for your faith, or Christians who attack you for not holding to their understanding of scripture? <laughs> so I've been getting a lot of email over the last uh, three weeks uh, since that Time Magazine piece and Good Morning America and Charlie Rose and all these other places where I talk pretty openly about my faith. And certainly I've been bothered by some of the messages from both sides. Um, I have to say for myself, the, part, the ones that wound me the most are from fellow believers, uh, who, some of whom really have unloaded uh, a pretty strong uh, set of opinions, uh, including considering me a false prophet. That was a little hard to take. Uh, and, you know, that in a certain way is the image that a lot of non-believers have of Christians, that we're narrow, we're critical, we're unloving. And, that is a heartbreaking circumstance and when you see it coming at you you know uh, what they're talking about so you know it's it's fine I expected uh, not everybody would be enthusiastic when you sort of stake out a, a harmonious position there's some people who are not really interested in harmony and they're gonna let you know and that's fine I, if we've in some way got a chance here to have more conversations of this sort uh, that is the main goal and uh, the rest of it is, is just fine Shall we go back and forth? Is that the plan? I think that's the plan. Okay. Uh, many good questions here. Won't be able to ask them all, but how about this one? Uh, was there a particular person named Adam who played an important role in human history? For example, Paul writes in Romans 5.19, For just as through the disobedience of one person, Adam, many became sinners, so also through the obedience of one person, Jesus Christ, many will be made righteous. I don't know the answer to that. If you read the little short paragraph that I wrote about Adam and Eve in the book, uh, you will be pretty clear that I'm not sure how to make the most of that particular part of uh, Genesis 2. It seems to me from scientific grounds that there are strong reasons to say that there were more than two founders uh, for Homo sapiens. Uh, when we look at population genetics and track back how many founders would it take to explain the variation that we see across the genome. <clears throat> not just the mitochondria, not just the Y chromosome, but the whole thing. Uh, the estimates are in the neighborhood of 10,000. And uh, it would be very difficult, therefore, uh, to, on the basis of science alone, uh, to advocate for Adam and Eve as the parents uh, of all of the human race. But I very much take Adam and Eve as the moment of infusion of the soul, uh, of the moral law, of free will, and of the fall. And I think those are critically important to our understanding of God's character and our own. Now, were they historical figures, two of those 10,000, that were the first to make that transition from animal to human, and that ultimately that found its way into the rest of the species, even though uh, the rest of the species was also going along? or where they intended to be representative of us in a more allegorical way. I don't know. I think you can defend both of those perspectives on a scientific ground, and I know people have very strong feelings about how to defend them on theological grounds. I uh, look, again, as you can probably tell, C.S. Lewis is my own spiritual mentor uh, in terms of the writings that he's made. Read his part in The Problem of Pain, where he describes his own view of creation. And it's pretty clear that he couldn't either figure out uh, whether this was intended to be a literal couple or not. And he also felt that we had wasted way too much time <coughs> worrying about that specific interpretation when we should have been talking about other things like God's love. Yes. You mentioned the potential for good with gene therapy and identification of gene defects. But there is some fear that this will lead to selective abortion, such as is now sometimes done for Down syndrome. Could you comment on whether these types of fears are valid? Yeah, I think this is an area of considerable concern uh, for believers and others who, who are really troubled about the prenatal applications of genetics. I am one of those. Uh, it, it seems to me that if the consequences of all our discoveries about genetics are to be primarily in that arena, we will have failed uh, and failed severely. My hope is, and I think it's beginning to be borne out, uh, that in fact the real payoff of genetics is going to be our ability to treat, uh, to prevent disease on people who have already been born uh, by figuring out what to do to keep them from falling ill. 
But I don't know that we can necessarily stop the applications of these discoveries in the prenatal arena. And I think we have a very serious issue here, particularly when it comes to this uh, new technology called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis that allows you uh, to make selection of embryos before deciding which ones to implant, that people are inclined to go further and further in the direction of milder and milder conditions uh, in that circumstance, perhaps even ultimately towards traits. And I think that is a major area of unresolved uh, bioethical discussion uh, that we need to have and a place where I think believers uh, should be at the table uh, and having uh, serious conversations about what society is really prepared to do and not do. Yes. Uh, how do you deal with people who suggest that sinful behaviors, moral behaviors, and belief in God or morality are all basically just genetically coded? Uh -huh. And they do, don't they? And that's a great question. So, you know, there's this whole field uh, of uh, sociobiology uh, which argues exactly that, uh, and there are many advocates of that. E.O. Wilson, a particularly prominent uh, proponent of this, uh, also a uh, prominent atheist. Daniel Dennett uh, wrote this recent book called Breaking the Spell that very much goes along this line. And all of this argues that, in fact, evolution can account for uh, everything from uh, the moral law, altruism, uh, and uh, even the search for God, which is a universal component of human beings. When you look at those uh, arguments, uh, I think they're actually quite hollow. Uh, they come across as a, as a list of just-so stories. And in many instances, I think you can actually argue quite compellingly uh, that what they're saying is counter to what evolution would do. And I think particularly this applies when you talk about our instinct uh, to try to do something for somebody else who is in trouble. El evolution operates not really on the group, it operates on the individual. If I'm walking down the bank of a river and I hear somebody in the middle of the river calling for help and I look out there and it's my worst enemy, evolution would say, let him go. But somewhere within me, and you know what I'm talking about, is this urge to say, I should try to help that person. It would be wrong not to do what I can, even though I may put my own life at risk. I cannot explain that on the basis of social biology. I don't want to hang my faith on this argument, but I think it's a pretty interesting counter-argument to some of the psychobabble that's being put out there uh, by some of the folks who are in this particular field who start with the premise, you know, that there has to be an evolutionary explanation for everything, so here's one, <laughs> and never really consider the alternative. You received much criticism for your faith in scientific, in scientific circles, and have you discussed your faith with Francis Crick? <laughs> I have actually not experienced much criticism, and I think that's encouraging, and I would encourage all of you who are worried about that, if you talk about your faith, that people will sort of come at you. Uh, I think there's some sort of polite changing of the subject that goes on uh, from people who are pretty uncomfortable just talking about it. But as far as actually coming at you and saying, you shouldn't be talking about that, that's not appropriate for a scientist, you're offending me, that almost never happens. Um, in terms of Crick, I've only met Crick a couple times. Uh, he's obviously now gone. He died about a year ago. A very sort of austere, somewhat unapproachable uh, fellow, um, and we did not talk about faith. Uh, he uh, pretty much decided the, uh, the conversation, and it was about uh, sort of the history of DNA because we were in a, a more public setting. But I've had many conversations with his partner, Jim Watson, who is an outspoken atheist. And uh, I wouldn't say I've made much headway uh, with Jim, and uh, I'm sure he would say he hasn't much made much headway with me. <laughs> I sent him my book, and uh, I'm still waiting for a response. <laughs> How are we doing, bud? How about we do two more? Okay. Okay, and then I have a little concluding uh, thing, which won't take